Slavic mythology has long been wrapped in a mystery. Today we will take a mere glimpse at the part of the mosaic of complex and magical stories that Slavic mythology contains. Stories that found their inspiration in the interesting and rich history of Slavic people, their distant migrations, cultural diversity and even persistent insistence on old faith, customs and rituals that have been preserved to this day. Although Slavic writing begins with the work of the saints Cyril and Methodius, we can partially reconstruct the original Slavic pantheon on the basis of archaeological findings. Slavic people belong to the ethnical group of Indo-Europeans, group that today dominates northern hemisphere and much of the world. From the most western coast of the North America, across the Atlantic and Europe, to the Indian subcontinent, through the Russian steppes, until the very far eastern city of Vladivostok, Indo-European languages had spread like a wildfire. Today, there are approximately 350 million of Slavic people in the world. There are 13 Slavic countries and 13 official languages, but up to the 8th century, Slavic people spoke a common language known as Proto-Slavic. Although today Slavic languages are quite different and Slavic people may have different appearances, all had evolved from the common heritage in the past 12 centuries. With the help of archaeological findings, ancient Slavs can be traced from the period between 2000 and 1000 AD. According to Herodotus, an ancient Greek historian, the Slavic people, or as he named them, the Neuri, were the tribe living beyond the Scythian in the upper stream of the Dnieper River. The ancient homeland of the Slavic people have long been controversial. Most evidence, however, suggests that the Slavic homeland was to the northeast of the Carpathian Mountains in the area around the Vistula River, Pripyat and the Dnieper River. In the north, the Slavs traded and maintained contact with the ancestors of today's Baltic peoples. On the east, they had connections with the Finns and on the west with the Germanic tribes. Lastly, on the other side of the Carpathian Mountains lived the Thracians. An extremely important role in the development of Slavic culture and mythology were early cultural contacts between the Slavs and various Iranian tribes. In the 1st century AD, the Iranian tribe known as Sarmatians penetrated deep into the Slavic territory and inhabited the territory of today's Ukraine around the Dnieper River. As before in history, for example, between the Romans and the Greeks, a period of mutual cultural influence began between the Slavs and the Iranian tribes. In this period, the Slavs borrowed quite a few Iranian words. Slavic words such as God, Paradise and the World all have an origin in Iranian languages. Like the Iranians, the Slavs worshipped the sun. They thought that the sun and the fire were the children of the god Svarok, the creator of the sunlight, heat and sky. Other deities that come from the Iranian pantheon are god Stribok, whose children are the winds and the skies. God Simargul is Iranian god Simurg, a winged dog who protected the tree that provided the seeds for all of the plants. Another important deity was a female goddess Mokosh, who is very similar to the Iranian goddess of Anahita. The name Mokosh comes from the Slavic word Moker, which means wet. From this, we can understand that the goddess was related to the water and rain, and the cult of fertility and abundance. Less clear is the origin of the god Veles, god of the animals, underground and war, also known as Volos, was one of the most important gods of the Slavic pantheon. Ancient Slavic people believed that god Veles could change shape into a dragon, snake, bull or a wolf. When Slavic people adopted Christianity, Veles was merged with the Byzantine god Saint Blaise, who Slavs called Vlach or Vlaho and remained the protector of the livestock up to this day. In the 6th century, Slavic tribes crossed the Danube River and began to march towards the south of the Balkan Peninsula. Although they encountered the resistance from the Trace, Greece and Illyricum, the Slavs were simply too numerous and strong for it to stop their advance. Slavic tribes even reached the walls of the Grand Constantinople. As described by several reports, they raided deep into the Roman territory and presented a great threat for everyone on the Balkan Peninsula. The Byzantine Empire wanted to stop the advance of the Slavic army by setting all of their settlements on fire. Unsuccessfully, however. The first mentioned supreme chieftain of the South Slavs, Daurentius, reportedly stated that others do not conquer our land, we conquer theirs, so it shall always be for us. 
John of Ephesus, noted in 581, the accursed people of the Slavs set out and plundered all of the Greece, the regions surrounding Thessalonica and Thrace, taking many towns and castles, laying waste, burning, pillaging and seizing the whole country. John perceived the Slavs as God's instrument for punishing the persecutors of the Monocephites. By the 580s, the Slavic communities around the Danube became larger and more organized. Along with the support of the Pannonian Avars, raids became larger and resulted in permanent settlements. From the Byzantine Greek scholar Procopius, we learn that Slavs regularly sacrificed animals to their supreme god, master of thunder, the mighty Perun. A regular gift was a rooster. On big holidays, however, they killed and offered goats, bears and even bulls. After the sacrifice, the believers ate the animal, as they believed it was covered with the holy manna of God and would give them power and strength. Procopius also describes how Slavic people worshipped the rivers, forests, nymphs and other demons to which they regularly sacrifice animals. In Slavic folklore, there are many tales about the rivers which drowned the travelers when they were behaving disrespectfully. Stenka Razin, a Cossack leader, supposedly sacrificed a Persian princess to the river Volga in the 7th century. When he threw a body in the river, he screamed, O oh mother Volga, you great Russian river, you gave me lots of gold and silver and other gifts, you raised me, you fed me and you brought me the glory, and I have done nothing in return to show my gratitude. Here is a gift, accept it from the hands of your loyal servant, Zaporozhian Cossack. The end of quote. In spite of the sacrifice, he was caught and executed by the Tsar guards a few years later. Ancient Slavs understood the concept of life quite differently than we do today. Through the spirituality and belief in the superstition, they perceived many things as supernatural. They believed that objects, creatures and even places all possessed a distinct spiritual essence. This religious belief is what we today know as animism. Trees and animals were worshipped as ancestors and respected as they were older and wiser than men. Certain animals were believed to have supernatural strength, the others were perceived as a manifestation of God. The animals that were worshipped were prohibited to kill or eat. Much like cattle in India, where it is believed that a cow is a manifestation of the mother goddess. Another important spiritual symbol in Slavic folklore was the Tree of Life. Certain trees marked holy places. In Russia, not so long ago, it was considered a sin to cut the old tree. According to folk mythology, the one who would cut the old tree would get mad, broke his arms and legs or even die. People believed that inside the trees lived the souls of the dead. From this myth, the tree ghosts in Russian called Lesnye was born. An important role in Slavic mythology were celebrations during the changing of the seasons. In the winter they celebrated Koliada in the honor of the god of winter, in the spring they celebrated several holidays in honor of the sun. Sun was very important symbol in Slavic pantheon as it was associated with the end of the winter and the life that came after. Typical symbol of the sun was a burning wheel. First it was covered with tar and after it was burned and it was spun on the stick. Summer celebrations were dedicated to the cult of Perun, the god of thunder. Perun was later adopted by the orthodoxy in the image of the saint Eliach. Ancient Slavic mythology is very closely related to funeral customs and rituals. At that time, not many people believed that after the death everything ends. On the contrary, people believed that after their death they would go to an unknown land and the life would continue. That is why the dead were buried with various objects from the previous life. In certain cases, men were even buried with a living widow. People believed that the earth cracks and holes in the grounds were the entries to the underworld, the place where Predniki Roda or in English ancestors of the people were residing. Around the 862, Viking Rurik and his followers gained control of the North Russian city of Ladoga and later most of the major Russian cities. He is the founder of the Rurik dynasty, which ruled the Kievan Rus and its successor states, including the Grand Duchy of Moscow and the Tsardom of Russia, until the 17th century. During the dynasty, many Slavic rituals and beliefs were converged with the Scandinavian ones and the original Slavic gods were losing their power. Roughly 100 years later, in the time of the first Russian Christian king Vladimir the Great, true Slavic gods gained their power back. 
The chronicler described Vladimir as a cruel and ruthless barbarian who came to power in 980. He celebrated his arrival to power by putting the statues of the various Slavic gods in front of his palace in Kiev. The biggest and most important statue was the wooden statue of Perun with a head made of silver and mouth made of gold. At the beginning of his reign, Vladimir sacrificed almost 1000 people to these gods. Nine years later, however, in 1989, Vladimir accepted Christianity under the Byzantine influence. As he adopted the new religion, so had to his people. Of course, this was only to be achieved with force. He started by removing all of the statues in front of his palace. Some statues were chopped down, others were burned. But the statue of Peru got the most unusual end. They brought the statue to the bank of the Dnieper river where the statue was thrown into the water. Vladimir ordered the soldiers to accompany the statue to the rapids so that it wouldn't wash up to the bank. Similar things were happening every time the Slavic people adopted Christianity. That is why there are so few images of the Slavic gods today. Although newly converted kings such as Vladimir or Danish king Valdemar were destroying Slavic symbolism, the people stubbornly resisted. As already mentioned, Perun reincarnated into Saint Iliach in Russia. In Baltic area, he reappeared as Baltic god of thunder, Perkunas. It was believed that whatever subject, tree or human the lightning from Perkunas may hit, it will automatically become holy. There is a tale from the year 1652 about an old man who traveled across Lithuania and ate a burned saddle that the lightning hit. He believed by eating it he will regain his strength and resistance to disease. Despite everything that has happened, interest in folk customs and rituals in the Slavic countries is widespread and preserved. Great examples of that are for example Bulgarian Kukeri, Slovenian Kurenti or perhaps Kupala Night that is annually celebrated in Ukraine, Poland, Belarus and Russia. There is still a lot we don't know for sure about our ancestors, but we know that Slavic mythology is one of the most wonderful and complex worlds that you could think of. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up and if you haven't yet, subscribe to this channel. And if you really don't want to miss any of my uploads, make sure you click that bell icon after you subscribe. I suppose that's all. Thank you for watching and until the next time.